Um, it's my day off on Friday, and uh, we've recently shifted it so that I now have a day off with Joanne and Amelia. It just used to be me and Amelia, which was less like a day off. And, um, and, and so we, uh, we tend to share the, the load. Even that, we feel outnumbered on a, on a regular basis. And, um, but we went to um, a little walk around uh, St. Catherine's Docks on Friday, and I said to Joanne, I really feel the need for an eggnog latte at Starbucks on St. Catherine's Docks. And that's always a good one on a Friday because Amelia loves a baby Chino. So she always pipes up and goes, baby Chino. And, and Joanne is, you know, outnumbered herself and we get our way. So off we went. And it was freezing, wasn't it, on Friday? And it was blowing this icy gale. And just as we came around the corner to Starbucks, they had their tables and chairs outside. I have no idea who might have sat out there, to be honest. Particularly when, just as we walked up, they suddenly blew away. The wind was so strong, and it just you know, frightened us. Amelia began to wail. She had a hood up. She was wrapped up. It was really cold. And life can feel like that sometimes, can't it? The icy wind blows through our lives. And the chairs and tables of our lives go flying everywhere. And we're not quite sure what's going on. And maybe it's our health. Maybe somebody in your family has just been diagnosed with cancer. Joanne's mum, Maureen, has just had that diagnosis. And it's a shock to the family. It's like... Chairs are being blown all over the place. We don't know what to do with it. What does the future hold? It might be family breakdown. Those you know and love have fallen out. It might be somebody you care about lives at a distance and you're just feeling lonely. Or you've known a betrayal in a relationship. Or maybe for you it's in the workplace where you've known failure and humiliation, even perhaps unemployment. Or maybe in this time of recession, you're struggling with money and you're seeing yourself falling further and further into debt and poverty. And you're facing the reality that you might lose your home because you can't pay the rent or you can't afford the mortgage. The extraordinary thing is Paul's life was quite like that. The chairs and tables were blown back and forth again and again. He was shipwrecked, he was betrayed, he was let down by his friends and colleagues, he was tortured, he was ridiculed, he was imprisoned. And this letter to the Philippians is written from prison. And yet one of the notes that sums up the letter, which is extraordinary when you think about it, is it's full of joy. It's full of joy. Fourteen times does Paul speak of joy or challenge the Philippians to rejoice or say to them that he is rejoicing? How does Paul remain joyful in the face of a life like that with so much suffering? And what does this passage in this Advent season say to us about that tonight? That's what we're going to be looking at. The first thing to think about, of course, is what is joy? Culture, our culture, 21st century UK, it says that joy is a feeling, doesn't it? It might be bliss or ecstasy or delight or cheer, gladness, happiness, warm, fuzzy feelings. Usually that means it's spontaneous and immediate, nearly always determined by the circumstances we find ourselves in. Somebody has given us a gift that is the gift that we have always wanted. We didn't expect it. It's out of the blue. Suddenly, joy wells up within our hearts, doesn't it? That's what our culture describes as joy. But I think Paul is rather more nuanced than that. Just look at verse 7. He says to them in, uh, in this version, it is right for me to feel this way about all of you. Now, some of you might have versions on your iPhones or in your uh, bags or whatever it is. That actually says... It is right for me to think this way about you. And the translators here are wrestling with this word, which in uh, the Greek is phronesis. And it's kind of halfway between thinking and feeling. It incorporates both of them. So it's kind of less cerebral than simply think. 
It's not an academic word, but it's more deliberate than feel. It's not touchy-feely. It's much more an attitude or a mindset, or you might call it kind of practical wisdom. And Paul here is simply reflecting the biblical view of the heart. So culture separates thoughts and feelings, mind and heart. And that can leave it feeling a little anti-intellectual, a bit sentimental, certainly fragile because we are uh, at the whim of the circumstances that we find ourselves in. But the Bible refuses to separate those two things, our thoughts and our feelings. And it says that the heart holds these, the seat of our personality, if you like, holds these two things together, thoughts, feelings. So Hebrews Chapter 4, verse 12, that you'll know well, speaks of what? The thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Thoughts and feelings. So I want to suggest to you this evening that Paul can be joyful in the face of suffering for two reasons. The first is something he feels. He knows that they are in it together. And the second is something that he knows. He knows that there is a bigger picture. And though we're going to look at them one after the other, he wants us to hold them together. You can't separate the two. But let's begin with that first one. We are in it together. Paul is joyful in the face of suffering because of this thing that he feels. He knows that he is in it together with the Philippians. Paul is suffering, yes, but he's not alone. This is not solitary confinement, even though he's locked away. He hasn't been in the dock by himself. The Philippians are with him. So he describes them, doesn't he, in some beautiful ways as partners in the gospel. What does that mean? Well, they've definitely been praying with Paul. There's a spiritual partnership that's been going on. Chapter 4, verse 3, says that they're co-workers with Paul. They're, there's a ministerial partnership going on. They're engaged in gospel work together. But I think also there's financial support. This uh, idea of, of being partners in the gospel, Paul uses with the Corinthians when he's talking about the gift that they've given him. So it's also a very practical partnership. So he talks about them as, as partners in the gospel. He also says that they are sharing in God's grace. That word sharing is a, is a really intimate word. It's, it's participating together. It's being partakers of. It's fellowship. It's union one with another. They're in it together. And of course, that's precisely how discipleship works. Inga Lanero, a member of our congregation, has just finished a master's in uh, pastoral theology, and her uh, thesis was on um, discipleship. How are we changed? How are our hearts changed within us? And her key finding, she said, was that we're changed through the relationships we have with one another. As we look at each other and think, I want to be like that, or they're in it with me together, we're sharing this experience together, in that way we are transformed from the inside out. So community is, is key to growth, which is why we are always banging on about being part of a connect group all the time. If you're not part of a connect group, and you guys are particularly awesome at doing that, can I just say, so most of you probably are, but if you're not, that is the place to belong at St. Paul Shadwell. That's where you discover who you are, what your identity is as a Christian. That's where we live life together. That's the place to love one another. That's why we're encouraging the development of, of small groups or cells. So Paul can be joyful because he loves the Philippians. Look at verse 7, he says, I have you in my heart. Verse 8, he says, I long for you, all of you, with affection. Do you notice how many times the word all is repeated in this passage? And that word affection is one of those words that has almost been kind of 
cleaned up a little bit because it's a little bit too radical for us. It's one of my favorite Greek words, so I'm just going to ask you to say it. I think I've done it before, but I'll do it again. Can you say the word splanknon? Splanknon. Just loud. Splanknon. That's where we get the word spleen. And it actually means bowels, your guts. So Paul here is saying, I long for all of you with the bowels, with my gut. It's deep down. It's right at the core, the center of my being. So Paul can be joyful because he loves the, the Philippians, but he can be joyful because he knows that God is up to something. See, this isn't just fellowship. It's not just friendship. It's not all about community, though it is that. Paul looks with the Philippians to the future. He has a hope for them. God has already started something in them, and he is confident that God will finish it, that he'll bring it to completion. That's what he says in verse 6. So Paul can be confident, he can be assured, because he trusts God. He places his faith in what God is doing, and that gives Paul hope. One of the commentators, Morna Hooker, on this passage says, Paul's confidence about the future is grounded in what God has already done in the past. So God is taking them somewhere and he's taking them there together. So Paul can be joyful in the face of suffering because of this thing that he feels that they are in it together. Second thing, there's a bigger picture. Paul can be joyful in the face of suffering because of something he knows. There's this bigger picture. He's part of something bigger. It's not all about him. He doesn't spend too much time looking in the mirror. Paul understands his own suffering to be part of something bigger. His suffering then for him is not meaningless. It's not his doing. It's not his fault. It's not simply a result of wrongdoing or law-breaking. He suffers on purpose. His suffering is for a reason. So he has a world view that shapes how he understands his life. It gives him the right perspective on those things that are going on in his life. So he has a story to tell, a story that he believes, a story that he's learnt about, that he's thought about and wrestled with, that he can then articulate, that helps to explain to himself what is actually going on. It's something that he understood. So you can see, he says, look, verse 7, that I'm suffering for the gospel. He's in chains. He's in prison. He's been facing opposition and criticism and rejection. But it's not personal against him. He's doing it for the gospel. That's how he understands what is going on in his life. He even goes so far as to say, look at... uh, a bit further on in, uh, in chapter 1, verses 12 to 14. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. Jump down to verse 18. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Even his suffering serves the gospel. Because he, of what he understands about Jesus and about what he has done for him, to live is Christ, to die is gain. That's extraordinary. What a place to be. You see, Paul's relationship with the Philippians is part of something bigger. 
The Philippians don't love Paul because he has a fantastic personality. And Paul doesn't love the Philippians because they just agree with him. Their relationship with one another is rooted in the love of God for his world. Their partnership is a partnership in the gospel. Their partnership has a purpose. So Paul doesn't defend himself when he's facing the authorities. He defends the gospel. Notice how they share together, they partake as in what? In God's grace. Not in suffering. That's not how Paul wants them to understand it. But in grace, even when he's in prison. And then notice when he says, how does he love them? He loves them with the affection of Christ Jesus. You see, it's not in that sense really from within himself. It's without. It's not Paul's bowels. It's Jesus' bowels. It's his love, his compassion that was seen on the cross. You see, and that's why for us here, connect groups are about more than community. They're not simply about going and enjoying spending time with our friends. They, are, they have a purpose. They have a calling. We are on mission together. They are gospel communities, just like the Philippians and Paul experienced. And Paul can be joyful because he is confident that this thing that he has thought about and wrestled with and come to understand and believe. He's confident that one day it will bear fruit. Do you notice how what he feels has this future element? He loves the Philippians and he's confident that God is doing something. He's begun it and he will finish it. And here he believes something about the gospel. He's come to understand the gospel and he believes, says verse 11, that one day it will bear fruit. That's the ultimate future. That's the hope that Paul has. And it means that he doesn't need to worry about his future. He's confident that he and they will be pure and blameless. They will be filled with the fruit of righteousness. All to the glory of God. That's the future that he is looking forward to. Whatever the present is that he finds himself in as he writes. And so just to draw things together. Paul can be joyful in the face of suffering because of something he feels. They are in it together. They love one another. But also because of something he knows, something he's learned, something he's understood. There's a bigger picture that they are all part of. And so he prays that the Philippians might understand what he understands. What They might experience what he has experienced. So he prays that their love might abound more and more. That they might understand and feel what he feels. That they're in it together. He prays that this love might abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. That they might understand what he knows. That there is a bigger picture. Why? So that they might know what is best. Simply the best. You see, Paul wants the best for them. Whatever the circumstances, he doesn't promise that it will sweep away suffering. Not in this life. But still he wants the best life possible for them. Whatever life throws at them. Whatever chairs and tables are swept away by the cold wind. So what does he say? What's he saying to us? Well, he's just saying effectively, put the church at the center of your life. However busy you are, however much you are passionate about your work, however, uh, whatever the demands that your boss puts on you, make time for community. Find a place to belong. Find a home that you can call your own, a connect group, a cell group, and make your decisions in light of that community. 
because we are in it together. So share your life. Be honest, be transparent about your work and where it might take you and your career expectations. Be honest and transparent about your finances and your money. Be honest and real and open about your relationships. Because we are in it together. That is how we will find joy in the face of suffering. Put the church at the center of your life. Secondly, put the gospel at the center of your life. Make sure you understand it. Think about it. Learn about it. Read about it. Get to know your Bible, the big picture, the plan of God's salvation and where you fit into it. God is is using each one of us. He's using you and he's using me to bring about his greater purposes. How does the life that you are experiencing at the moment fit into that? Give your life for the gospel. Don't waste your life. Christianity is is more than a lifestyle. It's more than a spiritual pastime to be squeezed into our leisure time or into our spare time. Live on purpose. Live as if it's true. Live as if you mean it. Live in the light of the future. Because hope is here. This Christian season, it promises a lot, doesn't it? You enjoy the advertising. It says, despite the cold uh, wind, despite the dark nights, if only you receive this product from someone this Christmas, you will know the joy of Christmas. It always disappoints, doesn't it? at the end of the day. But Paul's joy is so profound that it remains, it is intense, even in the face of suffering. It is the best life on offer. So let's take hold of it and live a life in which we are in it together. And where we know that there's a bigger picture. Let me pray. Can I ask you to stand?